Welcome to the Key Chapters podcast on Ephesians chapter 2. When we surrendered our lives to Jesus, we didn't do that in isolation. God was with us in that very moment, giving us the faith to call out upon Him. He then reoriented our lives and placed us in a church family of people who have also surrendered to the Lord, and together we are one church and one body in Christ. Now, these are profound truths that are from Ephesians chapter 2. And when they get a hold of our lives, they will change everything about how we live. And so I'm looking forward to going through Ephesians chapter 2 with you today in our daily podcast. It's going through the key chapters of the Bible. My name is Russ Brewer. I'm pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our Key Chapters podcast, where we're going through one chapter a day, trying to understand this message in light of the overall Word of God. So today we're going to Ephesians chapter 2. Now yesterday we started in Ephesians chapter 1, and we looked at the spiritual riches we have in Christ. We have been predestined to faith in Christ. We have been redeemed from sin and judgment. We have been adopted into God's family. We have received an inheritance. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And we are among everything that has been placed in subjection to Jesus. And at the end of chapter 1, Paul speaks about how we've all been placed into the church, which is the body of Christ. And now we're going into chapter 2, where Paul unpacks how we became part of this body and what it means for us all to be one in Christ. So let's go on to verse 1. Verse 1 connects back to chapter 1 with the opening word, and. Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So we are part of Christ's body, chapter 123, but we weren't always that way. In fact, we started out dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, when you think about a person who is dead, they're pretty much indifferent to life. They don't react real well. They don't respond to too much. They just sit there unresponsive because they're, they're dead. In a similar way, spiritually dead people are unresponsive to the truths about God. They're unresponsive to His holiness. They're unresponsive to the fact that they're guilty before Him. They're unresponsive to the call to worship Him. They're unresponsive to the proclamation of the gospel and forgiveness and new life in Christ. And so Paul is just saying, that's where we all started on out here. And notice the environment Paul is talking about here. He says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, these two words, trespasses and sins, they're similar. The word trespass points to doing things we shouldn't do. The word sin points to intentional wrongdoing. And various scholars have tried to make a distinction between these two words, but others have pointed out that Paul is not so much giving us a list of wrongdoings, but rather showing the environment of sin that we were all in. A person who is spiritually dead will do all kinds of things that are wrong, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. The point is, either way, they're doing all of these things because they're spiritually dead, and they're in a world that is spiritually dead. And so going on to verse 2, verse 2 is almost a description of this spiritual deadness, almost like a a morgue that all people start out in. Verse 2 says, we formerly walked according to the course of this world. That would be the morgue. And we just walk like everyone else. And when Paul says the course of this world, he is describing the way that the world operates, its manner, its methods, its habits. We might wonder, well, what's so bad about that? I mean, everyone's doing it, right? Well, look where the course of this world comes from in verse 2. Verse 2 says that this world's ways are energized by the prince of the power of the air, and that's just code for Satan. Satan energizes the ways of the world. Satan energizes the habits of the world. And when we're walking according to the ways of this world, we are joining in Satan's treasons against God. Now, maybe we think that we're good people, and this can't possibly describe us. Well, let's go on to verse 3, because Paul says in verse 3, Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now notice that Paul says we were all caught up in this scene. We all conducted ourselves in the lusts of this flesh. Paul's including himself in this. He's including you and I as well. We all live by the passions of our flesh. Maybe not always, or maybe not to the worst degree, but we weren't seeking to walk in God's holiness. We were all following our opinions or the world's opinions of what was right and wrong, and therefore we were all by nature children of wrath. Now, these opening verses describe all of us, and that makes it just that much more amazing that God has so graciously poured out on us the blessings of chapter 1. And verse 4 shows us how we enter into these blessings. And so going under verse 4, Verse 4 opens with this blazing ray of hope. It says, but God. Let's stop right there. We were spiritually dead, but God. We were walking in trespasses and sins, but God. We were walking according to the counsel of this world, but God. We were walking in the strength supplied by Satan, but God. We were walking the lusts of our flesh, but God. And we were walking the lusts of our mind, but God. 
But God what? Verse 4, verse 5, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so, but God, he was rich in mercy. But God, he had great love towards us. But God made us alive together with Christ. And so what God did for Jesus, he does for us. Jesus, remember, was dead in our trespasses, as in our sins were placed on him. But God made him alive. And likewise, in verse 5, when we were dead in our transgressions, God made us alive in Christ. And so going on to verse 6, God raised us up to the heavenly places and seated us with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word seated is in a grammatical verb tense that emphasizes the reality of this hope. It's already been done in the sphere of eternity. We already have a place with Christ in the realm of heaven. He is already expecting us. He's waiting for us. And in all of this, Paul wants us to see the contrast between the old life and the new life and going from a place of judgment to a place of his blessings. And so therefore, we were those who were dead in verse 1 but have now been made alive in verse 5. We were the ones following the ways of this world in verse 2 and now we're in relationship with Jesus and we're seated with him in the heavenly realms in verses 5 and 6. God's wrath, verse 3, has been resolved by his mercy, love, and grace and kindness poured out upon us, verses 4, 5, and 7. We have gone from being under his wrath, verse 3, to being blessed and saved by his grace, verses 5 and 8. In fact, as we look at verse 8, this is one of the most important verses on how we're saved. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Our salvation is not something that we did. It is by grace. What's grace? Grace is the idea of God giving blessings on people that they don't deserve. We don't deserve God's grace. We deserve His wrath. And yet God saves us by grace. Not because of something that we've done to deserve it. There is nothing we could do to earn it. It's not of works. It was just based on the mercy and the blessings and the goodness and the kindness of God. If there was something we did to deserve it, it wouldn't be grace. It'd be a reward. But salvation is not a reward here. Here we see it's a gift. It was a gift bought with the blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. When Jesus died, he paid the penalty for our sins. He redeemed us from sin so that we could become the children of God. And when Paul says we are saved by grace through faith, faith is simply believing that God has done this for us and it is fully complete in Christ with nothing more for us to add. And even we're seeing here, even our faith is a gift of God to us. Philippians 1.29 says something similar when it says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And so the, the faith we have, it's a gift that's been granted to us by God. And so when we were dead in our trespasses and sins and under God's wrath, in his grace, he made us alive and gave us the faith to call upon Christ to be our Lord. He was in that moment when we did that. It was all by God's grace. None of it was from ourselves. None of it was by our works. Now, our will was involved, we, we truly called upon him. But even the ability to do that was because God had made us spiritually alive in Christ. Now, does that mean it doesn't matter how we live then? Do, if we don't earn our salvation, can we live any way we want? Well, let's answer that question in verse 10. Verse 10 goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see here, God has a specific plan for each of our lives, for your life, for my life. He has good works for each of us to walk in. Being saved by grace doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter how we live. It just means that now we're living righteously and we're walking in the good works that God has prepared beforehand for us, not to earn our salvation, but because we've already been saved. Now, in all of this, Paul is actually going somewhere because he's writing to a church filled with Jews and Gentiles together. It's this mixed church who are coming together as the people of God. And we saw in Acts 19, you've got this great congregation filled with these, these Jews and Gentiles alike, all worshiping the Lord. But are there second-class citizens? Are there points of division? Are there groups of saved Jews and different groups of saved Gentiles? The whole point of chapter 2 is that they are all together in one body of Christ. So let's go on to verse 11. Verses 11 to 18 is, is all about the unity we have together in Christ. The word one here occurs four times in this passage, pointing to this unity that we are all one in Christ. And so going on to verse 12, Paul explains that, yes, the Gentiles were separated from Christ, as in they were separated from the Jewish Messiah. Remember, Christ is the Greek word for the Jewish Messiah. And so, yes, and yes, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. And to be excluded means we didn't belong among the people of God. 
And so, yes, all that's true. And verse 12 also says we were strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, what are these covenants that Paul is talking about here? If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, then you're probably very familiar with the the covenants of God because we've been talking about them a lot all the way going back to Genesis 6. In the Old Testament, covenants were promises that God gave to the Jews in the Old Testament, specifically the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New Covenant. And these covenants were between God and his people. And so when verse 12 says that we were strangers of these covenants, that means that we had no part in the promises that God was making to his people, and therefore we were without hope. But it didn't stay that way. Verse 13 says, Now we are all saved by the same Lord Jesus. Those who are far off have now been brought near. In verse 14, Jesus has brought peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. Everyone has been brought near again by the blood of Christ. In verse 15, there is now then no dividing wall between these two groups. In verse 16, we are all one body. And in verse 18, through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And so there are no second-class citizens among the people of God. All people who are saved by grace are together one body in Christ. Verse 19 goes on to say, You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, as in we are citizens of God's kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are fellow citizens together with this common citizenship in heaven. But not only are we citizens of God's kingdom, God is fitting us together to be members of his household. And so verse 19 says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. And this new household is based on this new work of God. The old household was based on the Old Testament scriptures. This new household is built on a new foundation, that of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus at the cornerstone. And so the foundation of this new body is the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and prophets gave the message that laid the groundwork for the rest of the church. That's why we keep going back to the words that they taught. Every church should be doing that. That's why we're going through this daily podcast. We're going back to the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. Now, who are these guys? The apostles that Paul is talking about here were the people specifically appointed by Jesus Christ to bring his gospel into the world. These men were given special authority and special gifts to bring God's message to the world and authenticate it with signs and wonders. They established and began to lay down a foundation. And with them was also the work of the prophets. They too were laying down this foundation. Now, prophets didn't have the same authority as the apostles, but they still communicated the word of God. And God used them to edify and build up his church until the Bible was written and completed. And so the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation that every church is to build upon. Now, I I think this means that once the foundation has been laid, we don't keep adding to it. And we think about if you build a house, you don't lay a foundation, then start to build and and build a floor or two and then lay another foundation a couple floors up. Once the foundation has been put in place, it doesn't need to be laid down over and over and over again. It's just one foundation. And so I don't think there's any more apostles or prophets. And if a person claims to be a prophet these days and they bring words that are different than the early church's words, well, then they're trying to lay a different foundation than the one that was first established by apostles and prophets. We're to be about their message, not our own. Now, notice it's also important that we see that the apostles and prophets also had a standard by which they were measured. That standard was Jesus Christ. He was the cornerstone, it says in the end of verse 20. Now, what's a cornerstone? A cornerstone is a large rock that was laid in a foundation, and then all of the other stones and bricks were placed down in relationship to the, the cornerstone. And they were aligned to it. And and the cornerstone was how you determine how everything else was laid. And so here we're seeing that Jesus is the cornerstone, which means that everything we do, everything we teach must be aligned with him by his will, by his word, according to the work he's doing even to this day. And Jesus is working even in this day because we see in verses 21 and 22 that we are being fitted together and built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. The idea of fitted there is this is the present work of God in our life. It's this idea where he is shaping us. And when God brings people together, there's going to be some shaping that's necessary. There's going to be some smoothing of the rough edges that are necessary. This is one of the beautiful things about being part of a healthy church. When we are part of a healthy church and we're all pursuing Christ and aligning our lives with him, there'll be times where we have to shape and refine each other's faith or walk or course of life. And because the Lord is using all of these dynamics to shape us, We're becoming more and more together, fitted to the work of God. And as we see in this passage here, as the Lord shapes us and unites us into this one body, verse 22 says, we become a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. 
And that's an incredible promise here. The Spirit of God dwells among us and He fills our work and He inhabits our praise. And we are this living body filled with His Spirit. Well, there's so much more to be said about Ephesians 2. It's a profound chapter about God's grace and our salvation, our life together in Christ. There's much to be praying about. So I'm going to leave you with the Lord. And until tomorrow, have a great day and God bless. 